we've all actually uh, walked through somewhat what a museum structure is and um, i mean looked at certain aspects of engaging with the is extremely important as a takeaway how do you have access into technically another visual language like we can be taught how to read and write english or hindi or gujarati or marathi but how do you learn how to read an artwork like we have replicas of some of the artworks on our sites they have intricate details that will um, give you access into understanding again our culture and popular culture i think a lot of us are wearing uh, what are indian and you'll actually see motifs of um, flowers of trees of beings that are from around here and there'll actually be a connection between all of this now how did i learn of um, these connections at some point so uh, let's start with this i'm priyanshi i'm technically trained as an art business person but i've been working in the art industry in india for about 15 years uh, and i'm extremely grateful for it one of the things that i was told very early on in my career is in india the best art history uh, teacher university guru is just your surroundings we live in delhi which is technically i mean there's a dispute whether it's made up of seven cities or 100 cities uh, but it's a lot of cities over a lot of years i mean in the prastha is right around where mahabharat was uh, technically jam mahabharat hui thi um so we are here looking at uh, two aspects of access into the art and culture industry one is publishing and um, the other is programming how do i help one engage with the art um, i worked a lot with tier 2 cities in india and one of the points of access that i have seen is again how do you even define art um, there is a certain colonized understanding of art that is technically framed and put on the wall um in south asia we've had the good grace of having art across mediums and again um i think i'll start with mr singh here who um heads the i mean he's held many 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 roles across his uh, career but is currently heading the um, publishing and research department at dag now a lot of you might have uh, gone to red fort for example in delhi i think one of the first um, such endeavors and i wouldn't even call it a museum and we'll uh, see why one of such endeavors was um, the project at dag which sir will tell us about uh, the, the project at red fort sorry and it comes from the practice that dag which is delhi art gallery has had which is to try and almost create an art history because i mean the way we are now getting access to it even through publishing even through a lot of ills um we don't even know like a lot of the artists who've done prolific extraordinary work in the last 200 years i think dag mainly accepts uh, accesses about 200 years of indian art history uh, so sir let's start with this ki um why the museumization or why that process and how so Okay, I'm there. Uh, uh, good evening, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Priyanshi, for that uh, really lovely introduction. Uh, because of the very large number of panelists, etc., I'm going to go through this reasonably soon and re uh, reasonably fast. Uh, DAG has built an inventory over the last 30 odd years of the largest collection of Indian pre-modern and modern art, and I speak in the context of visual arts, of painting and sculpture, uh, largely in the way it's defined, etc. And that has given it access to create uh, truly historical exhibitions, which of course uh, run out of its galleries. But I think we've also been very fortunate to have had opportunities to work with the Archaeological Survey of India and the National Gallery of uh, Modern Art. uh where at uh, red fort delhi uh when a large number of the uh buildings there were renovated the barracks were renovated one of those was uh, afforded to us uh, uh, we were asked to put up a museum exhibition over there uh, which is where drishyakala came about we worked with scenographers internationally we brought in some of the most brilliant art within the context of uh in the uh, delhi as a capital red fort as its uh, epicenter 
to curate four exhibitions, one on the National Treasured Artists, another on the, another on the Daniels and their journey uh, uh, through in, uh, India, uh, the Aquitans, and the first time those 144 Aquitans were actually shown here. Um, there was an exhibition on portraits and another on popular prints. Now the point of the purpose is not to really talk about the curatorial aspect over here as much as to talk about the engagement. For us, that was a eye-opener in how we saw footfalls come into a, a space. 3,000, 4,000 and up to 5,000 footfalls every single day into one building to look at Perhaps for many, many of the visitors, uh, the first original works of art they would see uh, in their lifetimes, etc. So that gave us the strength to move on to and open another uh, similar exhibition in Kolkata, also with the Archaeological Survey of India, uh, at the old currency building called Ghare Bairi, where we did an entire curatorial program on the history of Bengal art and art that emerged out of Bengal. I think what was very, very um, important to us was to make sure that the programming was intense, there was an emotional quotient that was attached to it, there was material that people who scared to come in and ask, even though we had extremely friendly colleagues who would take them around, uh, do little walkthroughs for them, explain works of art, etc. But texts everywhere, uh, we had iPads where you could just flip through screens, uh, we had material in Delhi of course in Hindi, uh, in Kolkata it was in English and Bengali etc. So we made sure that there was a lot of access, a lot of programming, a lot of engagement and I think that was one of the most intense exercises that we've undertaken as an organization. Part of that now has intensified in the way we're moving forward. We've always enjoyed a very strong research and documentation uh, program uh, with publications that accompany each of our exhibitions. Uh, so the very large number of books that we have done, in a sense record, uh, rewrite, and rededicate the art history that we have learned, have to unlearn and have to relearn going forward in various ways. Um, with our publishing program, also Priyanshi, you'll be delighted to know, we now have an equally intense filmmaking program, uh, which has been uh, initiated uh, some months back, etc. And therefore, we have an agenda to make 200 to 300 films on art, artworks, art movements, artists, etc. Also, to, uh, to take forward the engagement, to be able to run these, of course, at various centers, museums, galleries, etc., but also to have shorter versions that we can post on social media, that we can push uh, over uh, WhatsApp, uh, etc. So people have easy access and they're not frightened of that word called art and that other word called museums. The two very often uh, create a certain sense of elitism and I think it's time for all of us to take away that elitism, which is what I'm really, really delighted to see this conference pushing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Singh, and also congratulations on the new gallery space. Uh, it's in Janpat, so it's very close by. We can also visit it soon. Uh, you bring up the film program, and that was actually um, something that I had noticed around here, which I think, um, and I don't want to blame a generation for it, because I think if as a young individual you're growing up with that much technology and that flip video which is videos under 60 seconds that are easily scrolled through your thumb uh, your attention span does uh, change and that has reduced uh, the capacity of concentration to even read say long-form journalism and I know that even really really good journalistic organizations that do concentrate on research now do end up making shorter versions for social media for example so that's fantastic because you have so much data and for it to just be restricted to books which i mean as sad as it might make some of us is not uh, yeah they're very accessible um thank you for that now um we also look at i mean as mr singh was saying um Museums do become a slightly scary place. Um, scary in the sense it is that you're expe expected to behave a certain way. You're expected to, um, I mean, 
view art really formally and then one might question that why don't I just bring it to my bedroom and see it in the comfort of my own home. Um, we do, I mean, we talk about publishing and programming and I think just making art part of our consciousness, publishing is a very easy way to um, look into that. And uh, we have Mr. Bipin Shah, director of Mapping Publishing House. Um, so I actually want to just pose two quick questions for you. One is, um, you started your journey um, some decades ago from New York. So I want to know what was the impetus of you starting the journey in New York. And also you've had over four decades of uh, experience with Mapping. And uh, two things, one, are you, uh, what is the sort of target audience that you have when you make these beautiful books about Indian art and culture? Are you now looking at making books about Indian art for an Indian audience? Because we do have the capacity to now spend on this kind of books. Uh, and the second is, um, I know you all do books in vernacular languages. And one of the other um, sort of barriers of entry that we've had in understanding Indian art and culture very often has been the language. Um, I know a lot of us in the last four, five, seven years have started looking at the vernacular as a point of access, uh, more from the artist's perspective, especially for someone like me who works in the contemporary art space, the artist needs to be able to communicate in the language that they need. Uh, but I want to understand that, okay, how has language uh, been, is it part of the thinking that you all have right now with mapping? Thank you, Priyakshi, and thank you for Ministry of Culture and especially Mrs. Uh, Mukda Sinha for creating this uh, event. Uh, it's quite a visionary event, and I hope uh, something like this will continue on an annual basis. Uh, my journey started in New York uh, as I was living and working there in publishing industry, and then uh, was always thinking of creating something in India uh, as Indian art book publishing and visual arts publishing had not really quite taken off uh, in the 80s. So that was the germination of uh, starting Mapping Publishing. And uh, from day one, we had thought that this is, we will focus primarily on visual arts of India. And that is, a, that is an area which had not really developed in India, in Indian publishing. Uh, we have been publishing for an international market from day one. So we are going both in both directions. We are working with international museums and bringing exhibition catalogs and collections and publishing it in India and international market. And whatever we are creating in India uh, with Indian art objects, uh, which is also uh, traveling through our distribution network in the international market. So it, it is going in both directions. Uh, these books, uh, major art books, haven't gone into regional languages, uh, but we do some children's books which are aimed at sort of bringing Indian art to children, and those have gone into the uh, regional languages, and that is something that we plan to continue doing that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cha. Now I'll actually go to the other person from publishing on our panel. Um, we have Tusha De Niyogi, director and CEO of Niyogi Books, who also works a fair bit with translation. Um, so I'm again going to one look at what is the uh, publishing parameter that, uh, like, why do you select the books you do? And I'm, I know you, you get a lot of that question. Uh, the other aspect I want to come to is, as a publishing house, what are the primary marketing channels you use? Because you all are publishing very interesting books. Uh, but as we were discussing with the books versus film and the video aspect of it, uh, it is becoming a little difficult to have books. And that too, books that are not in a primarily very uh, popular uh, domain. And I'll give you one example of how marketing is very often 
popular marketing avenues are frowned upon in the culture space, which I don't agree with. But Atan Bhagat had come out with a book um, last to last year, which was the second year of the pandemic, 2021. And he had launched the book with a trailer on YouTube with Vikrant Masih. Fabulous actor, a three minute YouTube ad would run, popularizing a book that Chetan Bhagat, an already extremely popular writer, was doing. Now the stiff upper lip literature world was just like, okay, this is below us. Like, how are you starting? And he's like, come on, tell me, which writer in today's day and age doesn't want the kind of selling rights that I have? Which is also true. So how do you all traverse that line between the popular and keeping the books interesting and reaching out to a wider audience? Okay, thank you. Are there a lot of... I have... First one, um, the first uh, part of the question is talk my marketing channels but before I talk about the marketing channels I have to talk about the the addressable market that I have right so um, uh, the Yogi Books is in general trade publishing we publish across five imprints uh, illustrated books um, translations we also do fiction we also do non Now, having put together all of them together, each book has its own market. Now, let me talk about just art books, just addressing the art books. We know that the art industry, especially the uh, data right now, you would know better in 2021. Crore or something was the turnover auction? That's yeah. just the auction price, right? Yeah, so it's much higher than that. So. That gives us an indication that there is art. So now when we do a book, that is one of the area that is accessible to us. But that's not limited to that. Now when we do, do a book on architecture, let's say I'm just taking examples. Um, architecture, like cities and buildings are not really as portable as art, right? So it's easier to talk about these through books. So we have another segment, which may appear as a niche, but when we put all, all of them together, they're not really niche niche. They are actually the general trade, the general readers per se. Now, when we talk about books from museums again, uh, let's say fiction. Um, We've uh, seen Night in the Museum, we just had another quiz which talked about the Night in the Museum too. They're all based in museums, but they are also promoting museums into a different readership. People who enjoy uh, fiction but at the same time are interested or could get interested into the museums. Apart from that, again, we have children's book from museums. I'm focusing on the books which are done in collaboration with museums today because then if you put all of them together, my addressable market is between 6 to 99 or 5 to 99. And uh, we've also started doing Hindi illustrated books. So then that goes, that exponentially increases my readership. So having said that, now if I go to talk about the marketing channels, they're generally the ones which every publisher use, uh, social media, through uh, uh, through email marketing, through actually point of sale marketing, and so on and so forth. But when museums and publishers and other stakeholders come together to create, to actually talk about these things together, that's when the maximum impact happens. For example, there's an exhibition, how DHE does. There's an exhibition, there's a book which goes along with it. Right, so you know there are two touch points of communication over there. And it works best when we all work together in a 360 degree uh, format. Now, uh, which was the second question? Um, the second question was about popular forms of marketing. Now, it's not that we don't make reels. We make reels also for Instagram. But that is to entice a reader into the book, to the book. The amount of beautiful information, the language cannot come out through social media. So there are always 
um, some to entice the audience towards it. Just to give a brief, uh, something a little small nugget of information. So when you're talking about short attention span, that addresses that problem. But anybody interested in it will actually go to the book and get the book and read it. So, and when we talk about, say, Chetan Bhagat and Vikran Masi, um, so see, they're connected would together. You, would you do a popular, say, film actor as a, I don't know, mascot of one of the books that are coming? Um, it depends which book. That? So, and it depends also, I mean, book. Uh, one of the other things we were talking about is whatever we might say, most of publishing may not be able to afford actors as this thing, but. Uh, but my bigger question is that if you do that, the other aspect is that you have a guilt of in some way, um, you know, stepping down from this high culture and popular culture, which I, yeah, which is where I, my question was sort of trying to address that. So it's not that, it's a matter of perception and we'll read that, leave that to the reader or the uh, viewer. But having said that, uh, the Chetan Bhagat and Vikran Masi uh, collaboration is a brilliant uh, collaboration. Especially because both of them are connected through the form of storytelling. They might be in different mediums, but when we talk about books of art, is the art, the writer, the, mu the museum, they are the basic heroes because the problem of authenticity does not come there. So there, it's not about being highbrow, it is authenticity of the face of your book that matters and that's any marketing channel, any marketing profession will agree to that. So yeah, that's basically that. Thank you, uh, Trisha. Uh, we move on to another kind of, I don't know if we can call it publishing, but uh, for me, this is something that you use to Again, be able to access. We have uh, a lot of very dense subjects like museums and archaeological sites, and um, yeah. And we're actually now going to move into a little bit of technology space. So, again, trying to connect with an uh, with a generation that is very adept at technology, and how can they use something like technology to? actually help us achieve our goals of reaching out to a wider audience, of engaging better and having lasting uh, impressions in the consciousness of people. Uh, so we have Shalini Bansal, co-founder of Hop On India and Museum 22 by Desi Walk Tours Private Limited. So I believe ma'am you have a small presentation for us as well where you take us through uh, the practice that you have. and. I want to uh, specifically look at what have been the main fulcrum points in your journey thus far of creating these um, applications and other points of access into uh, these spaces and how are you looking at engaging with AI. And I want to give a small example of a museum that I recently went to in Amritsar which was a very interesting and a slightly confusing experience. It is the um, Gobindgar Fort in Amritsar and uh, we all know a lot of these glorious stories of a lot of uh, gurus and saints and they had this a small 10-minute uh, uh, 7D experience on uh, one of the Sikh gurus and it's such a beautiful story but it was told with such little budget that it sort of left a lot of us wanting for just a little more finesse and I think, again, a lot of us are very proud of our culture, keep asking this question as to how can we actually present it better. We have the, we, I mean, I'm not trying to get onto a grading scale, but we have great stories. Be it in mythology, be it in culture. Again, a lot of these stories that we see in the miniature paintings that are there around us, they're fantastic stories. Uh, they're better than most uh, best-selling fiction that is published today. Uh, but yeah, how do we make it accessible and how can we use technology uh, more judiciously? Yeah. So I think we'll start by actually telling you what we do. Uh, I would request the presentation to be put up on the screen for that. Um, thank you, thank you so much. So we are a startup. We are just about seven years into this business. And uh, we started by actually making our own app called Hop On India. First, we started writing stories because we thought we had a lot of stories to tell about India and there was nowhere that we were being able to really disseminate those stories in an authentic manner. 
So we decided the most democratic manner may be to reach out into people's phone. Uh, and therefore we created an app which is called Hop on India. However, three years into this we realized people don't love to listen so much about what we thought they would love to listen to. So we started, we redid our technology to some extent and we started white labeling our technology and offering it on a SaaS basis to museums. So what we essentially do now is create mobile applications for museums. Uh, in most of the museums, the mobile applications are used as audio guides. The idea is uh, to make it democratic, so it really helps you cross all the physical boundaries, geographical boundaries. There is absolutely no boundation of time at anywhere, anytime your museum is available to you on the phone. It comes with much more, but that is, that is essentially what we set out to do. Um, I will just move on to the next slide. I think the best way to, um, I believe this trigger is not working, can I? Yeah, thanks. So the best way to actually speak about what we do is to present some case studies of work that we've done with Indian museums. The first one that I'm going to talk about is the National Gallery of Modern Art, where we made an app that serves as an audio guide across three of their campuses, uh, Delhi, Mumbai and Bangalore. The idea when we started off was to provide something that people could visit from their homes because we launched exactly two years back in the absolute thickness of COVID where people were not even stepping out of their rooms, leave alone their homes. And we got a wonderful response. The public really loved it. The museum also shifts artworks, puts them up into exhibitions, takes them back into galleries, shifts them one, from one place to another. And we thought, this made it much easier for the museum to tell its stories across shifting destinations. Um, the figures are up there for you to see. Uh, we had a wonderful response. The app still works across all the three campuses. People also access it outside of the museums. The second one that I would like to talk about is the Salah Jung Museum. At Salah Jung, we have 44,000 objects, perhaps more now, and 39 galleries to talk of. The challenge was to be able to give an audio guided tour to a person in a very comprehensive manner so that he comes out knowing what the museum is all about in just about a two hour visit. So we put together a curated tour where we talked about the galleries and star objects. Um, the guide is multilingual to the extent that it has English and Hindi as of now. We are adding Telugu as we speak. Um, what this has really led us to believe is that people do like to listen. If we are able to disseminate information in a user-centric manner, people do like to listen. It is, about, it is about being able to understand what the user really wants. So we made the information very crisp, bite-sized. We made it in the format people would like to listen and take back. There is, of course, a select audience which likes to know more. For them, we, we do, of course, forward them to the museum team. The third one that I talk about is perhaps one of the largest museums in public space. It's the art museum that you see at the Mumbai airport. Uh, it was Jayahi Museum. It is now called the Art Beat of New India. We created the app for Jayahi earlier, and now we've created one for Art Beat. Um, so this was, this was a museum which had different challenges. They could not afford to give an audio guide device because how do you collect it back? The airport is a high security zone. It's a place where people are always in transit. They're always rushing to catch their flights. And the museum was really struggling to catch attention. They were very sure people wanted to know more about the artworks. People always stop by, but they don't have the time and patience to read. So therefore we put up QR codes with the audio stories and believe me people do stop people do scan the codes <laughs> yeah thank you so much <laughs> and people do download the app and they actually listen to the tour even on flight at times I'm told we've had some lovely feedback on that so therefore uh, I would tend to believe that uh, yes we we are sort of being able to reach uh, and disseminate information the way people would like it these are some of the museums we've done and 
we've we've gone beyond museums as well. We've done some uh, street art tours for Asian paints and Start India as well. Thank you, thank you, Pianchi. Thank you, ma'am. And yes, do keep an eye out for small QR codes next to the artworks at the Bombay Museum, uh, at the Bombay Airport. Uh, and even the app now, the next time I go to any of these museums, I'm going to download the app and try and go through that as well. Uh, looking at apps and technology, we have Professor Pradeep Parma, uh, who is currently working as the advisor of the National Virtual Library of India project. On behalf of IIT Bombay, Professor Varma is a management professional and educator who has been working on a digital platform called the Indian Culture Portal. Professor Varma, could you share the two projects with us? And also talk, uh, like, just talk a little bit. I think he's, yeah, he's going to present from there. Uh, and talk about how you are contemporizing access for a contemporary audience in India. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm not going to make a presentation because that really takes too much time, especially when we are talking about something like the Indian Culture Portal, which has a huge amount of content on it, which we have created. Um, it was a pleasure hearing my fellow panelists speak about publishing in the field of arts. Shalini Bansal's initiative of Museum 22 is a step forward in maintaining and making museums accessible digitally. Now, continuing this conversation about the digital world, uh, let me bring to you the Indian Culture Portal. This has been envisioned as a one-stop source for a range of resources on Indian history, heritage, and culture. And all of this has been sourced from museums and institutions across India. So we have We've been very particular about sourcing, about verifying, authenticating all the information we have. We were launched in 2019 with a very limited amount of data. However, the, today the portal has grown a lot over the last five years. And uh, we have hundreds of thousands of items of content, books, gazettes, gazetteers, paintings, museum artifacts, a lot of things. So our aim is really to democratize access. What happens is, and a lot of us know this, it's not easy for everybody to get up, get out of their houses and go to a museum or go to a library. So here, through this effort, we bring everybody there. We bring the museum or library down to you, wherever you are. And when I say democratize, it is also because everything we have on offer is free of cost. We don't charge anything, we don't ask you to log in. We are making it easy for the user to come and get interested in Indian history, heritage, or culture. As far as we know, there is not one single platform, a digital platform, which offers a variety of content that we have and the large amount of content that we have. So basically, it was during, uh, somebody mentioned, I think Shalini or somebody mentioned, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. And what we saw was during the pandemic, people just could not get out of home. And so they were missing out on, on going to the museums and the libraries and all. And so the Indian Culture Portal, we saw a large uptick on users on our portal. Because of the advantages that it was available 24 seven, it is available across the world. It is available free of cost anytime, anywhere, free of cost. So you don't need to go anywhere to a library or museum or anywhere else. We provide access to numerous resources in a variety of categories. You'll see them flowing across the screen over there. Some of them, uh, each one of them actually talks to a different audience. So, for example, when I make a presentation, and I start talking about food and culture, I suddenly see a huge amount of interest. If somebody has gone to sleep, they wake up. Suddenly, oh, food and culture, recipe is very nice. And everything that, I, as I said, everything that we have is authenticated. So if there is a recipe that we are presenting, 
It's a recipe somebody has actually cooked and checked that it works, and so we put it there. That kind of thing. Uh, we have a huge number of rare books uh, in the collection that we have. Some of them dating back to the 12th century. And we have them in multiple languages, including non-Indian languages. We have pres presented them in a flip book format, so whoever is reading it, it's as if they are flipping the pages of a book. So we are not very far from the paper publishers in that sense, because they're, although of course I'm a reader and I know that the sense you get of reading a physical book is very different. I can never give that, the smell, the touch of the paper, I can never give that. But at least I'm providing access in many, many different ways. Uh, we have a lot of multimedia resources, audios, video, audio clips, and a lot of videos, uh, which uh, again is something that a paper book cannot provide. Here at the click of a mouse, you get to see videos of the best dancers, you get to hear the best musicians, you get to know their story, you get to know the backstory, everything. Because that is the beauty of this medium, the beauty of the digital music medium. So apart from a lot of content that we have collected from various institutions, I have a team of researchers who do a lot of research and we present also a lot of original content. You might have seen flowing across your screen something called stories, something called snippets. So we have original content which has been researched by the team. And the research is done at the museum, which is done at the National Archives, things of that kind. So anybody who is eager to learn more about Indian history, about Indian heritage, about Indian culture, for example, and this is the one place where you'll find a lot of information, for example, on the Northeast. We've created a section on the Northeast Archive because we realize that not too many people know about the Northeast. How many people even know how many states there are, if there are state, eight states, which are those states? So we've put it all together. So sitting at home now, you can experience walking through heritage sites and monuments. We have created virtual walkthroughs. And uh, they are designed using software in a way that actually gives you a sense that you're actually there. For example, we've got a section on the Ajanta Caves. Uh, where you can, on the on the portal, you can pan, zoom, you can magnify, you can do all kinds of things. Again, why I'm talking about this is because this is the difference between a physical paper format and a digital format. It gives us a lot more flexibility to present the information in many different ways. We, of course, have uh, users from all over the place, including a lot of academic researchers, and uh, we are proud to be here and uh, to present all this to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Verma. Uh, it's very interesting. And uh, we can log on to the website to get access to yeah, the portal. Um, when we're looking at creating lasting impacts, uh, and I think we were having this conversation about digital versus physical, um, there is data to prove that if I make the effort to access something, it will have a last, more like ingrained impact in my consciousness and my, the learning will be greater. And I know a lot of us have uh, discounted the Indian education system for pushing us into this rote learning format. But the fact that we were made to work harder than a lot of other kids say in our like primary education stage, basic concepts are more ingrained. So that is one of the reasons why even a project like say the Google and Art and Culture project, uh, they eventually were very clear that yeah, we're only wetting the appetite and for uh, the actual experience of engaging with art, we do invite you to come here. And I think your purpose is slightly different, where yours is also to look at it from a slightly more academic point of view and understand the research. And it's not so much just the experience of engaging with art. So. So our purpose actually is not only to serve the academics, because uh, very consciously the writing that we do, we have made sure that there are no footnotes and all those kinds of things which researchers like. We kept in mind that our audience is a lay person out there. Okay. We've used very simple language right through the portal, huh. so that 
you know, it's not just meant for some academician somewhere or the other. Okay. The other thing that I did not mention is that uh, this is a bilingual portal. Okay. Both English and English Hindi. English and Hindi. Hindi. We plan eventually to go into the other language, Indian languages. Yeah. But it's a huge effort. I just want, you know, we were talking before. Yeah. Language is... Machine translation somehow does not cut the eyes. Yeah. It just does not. So actually have a team of translators. Okay. And again, it's a huge task. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially for culture because you're, again, you have to recontextualize it yes. rather than just plain yes. translate. Yeah. But I think yeah, that is extremely important yes. in our way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, when we look at, uh, again, physical spaces and as someone who uh, is extremely fond of them and I do stand by the importance of the actual experience of engaging with art in the physical form. Uh, we have Dr. Reema Huja, an archaeologist, historian, heritage consultant and writer and is currently the director of the Maharaja Savai Man Singh II Museum in Jaipur. Uh, Ma'am, I want to actually probe into your experience of multiple decades of working within the culture scene and also culture is made and experienced by the people like you've seen the audiences of the country change over time you've seen the idea of uh, just sort of cursorily engaging with our art and culture then to be proud of it without understanding it and now coming to a place where there's actual curiosity of trying to understand what is our culture and art is that one access point so uh, ma'am i want to just probe into that experience and also now what are the kind of programming efforts that y'all are making to engage with the uh, current audiences and I think all of us have um, tapped into the technology button so is, are there any endeavors of that kind within your music? Thank you very much and I would like to thank the Ministry of Culture and particularly Bugda um, Sinaji uh, for having me here. Yeah. That's, uh, if you need to have the presentation with the ticket. Um, okay, no I think as long as it runs on a loop. Oh, okay, perfect. But, Thank you very much for asking the questions you've had and for giving me the introduction that you have. Because my, my, I am all the things that you talked about and I'm also myself. So I don't have, I've not always been a teacher. I'm a teacher, you can hear by the way I'm talking. Uh, and I've not always been a museum person. And I think that is where I'm going to start with. That I have come into the museum world like most of us do. Growing up, you see a museum, you either get intrigued and you get pulled in. Or what happens to a lot of people, they don't quite know why they're there. And you have to entice them back. So I want to bring us back to, uh, that is the reason I started with the thanks. Uh, the experience today is really what a museum is all about. You go in and there is so much happening. There are things which you have to look at. There are sights and sounds around you. In the case of the City Palace Museum, we're just showing you what we have here. Uh, the buildings also are worth looking at. So the average person going into a museum has a choice, but at the same time, it's a controlled choice. Now I'm going to stop for uh, the, that train of thought and come back to it for a minute, just to say why I have our publications on here as a loop. One of the things a lot of museums did from the time museums started, and the MSMS2 Museum in Jaipur, the Maharaja Savai Man Singh Museum, goes back to the late 1950s, though of course most of the work happened uh, as they went along. And the publications, as you can see by some of the covers as they come up the next time round, are dated. And some of the other ones which come, thank you Niyogi, are very much more recent, but they encapsulate in part the collection and in part they go back to the very early days of catalogues that came out. So you have, what do you have? You have something to, that if you choose to buy and take away a book, you have something that gives you pretty pictures that you can keep going back to, so it's your souvenir, but you also have um, details about part of the collection, not everything, not everything can go into it. So it becomes a way of getting you back to that museum, so much so that you will pick up a, a book even if you're not going to be in that city for very long. And uh, some of the other things we have, I'm afraid I don't have a copy, a print of it here. We do have a braille book also. So, you know, we've tried audio guides, we've tried uh, braille book. Uh, the audio guide part hasn't quite worked because some visitors want that. 
Some visitors want the human face. And then, you know. But again, as I said, I won't go down that road so much. It's to say that even with publications, what comes next? So we have had two story books that came out, uh, which are which are based around the city palace and around these kind of labyrinths that lead out who knows where and a little adventure. And I think that is the sort of thing that we might need to work on. Because when we were talking about lack of span of attention in today's age, I think it's always been there. Whether it's the Jatak or the Hitoktesh or um, the Arabian Nights, you know, 1001 Nights, the, you always end by saying, and there is more. So, you know, stay awake or wait for the next chapter. And that is probably one of the things we need to work on in museums, that it's not just a static collection. It's not just something that has been uploaded or downloaded onto this that you talk about. But being a museum collection, it may not be something that you can keep changing every day. In fact, you can't. So when you go in for digital or uh, interactives, or we have a range, you know, virtual reality, augmented, much more. Who knows where AI will be taking us? But with that, at the end of the day, you still have material that tells a story of a certain time that we have. And we can put it away safely and use that. You know, you can use digital images and tell a story on that. What are we telling the story of? And how will the average audience relate to that and want to come back to it over and over again? For us, besides this museum, the Trust also has a museum up on the hill, which is a fort with one of the largest cannons in at least in Asia that has been fired once, so people come to see it. The pandemic was a big learning experience because we did try to go online and some museums were very successful with the material that they went online with. We figured uh, that what were the other things that we could also be doing. So we perhaps haven't done so much online as some others have, but it did become a big learning experience because the minute they were, uh, we were able to have visitors back in, we also are lucky enough to have a beautiful building or a set of buildings, you know, it's an old palace. And so it was safe to walk around the outside of the fort and of the City Palace Museum, even if the galleries were going to be limited entry only. So that became something. How else could we reach out to the local people? So again, some museums, uh, we have we have our uh, international colleagues here and their museums get visitors from different parts of the world. The museum I work for also does. But when that visit ended, we were getting a lot more of the local visitors. So what were we doing with that? You know, and there were people coming, there was people teaching in the um, deprived areas who said, can we bring our children in? So once it was safe, they came in, masks and all. And at the end of it, they were just asked, what do you like best? Um, one of them said, when I grow up, I want to work here, which I think is the way that we want. We want them to start appreciating what the world has created. Whether it is, you know, whether we talk about a science museum, then the wonder of it all, or an object-based museum. So where can we go with all of that? And one of the other realizations we had, which is bringing me back to what all of you have been talking about, is technology. Because another museum I'm connected with as managing trustee of the Jaipur Virasat Foundation, and Jaipur Virasat Foundation is what initially started the Jaipur Literature Festival, which is, we have an MOU with Teamworks on, uh, is a beautiful museum in a very small space. It's in a 1950s colonial bungalow, but only part of it. You know, one hall, three tiny rooms, where uh, Gallagher and Associates worked pro bono and gave a living experience. So it is musicians where, where again, you know, earlier today, Shubha Chaudhary was talking about ethics of somebody's voice. So we have, we have uh, little windows where you can hear them, watch them, but we have them on board. And so that small space becomes a window where you can actually have musicians come in and perform. And that may be one of the ways forward for all of us in all the things we are doing. If younger people, you know, think science fiction, if they're going to be attracted to Night at the Museum kind of way of getting into museums, let's do it that way. If, uh, I used to often think about putting a cassette, in the that dates me, 
you know, an actual cassette or a CD or whatever we are coming to now at the end of a book so that you could hear that. But now we are talking of e-books. So what else can we do? We also have audio books. Audio books, certainly. Uh, it doesn't have the same feel. But remember, the world was an oral culture and we've only had 200 years of it being a truly literate, you know, literacy based in that sense. Who knows what we are coming out with. I think the, the bottom line is that we are in such an exciting world as we've seen with the exhibits around us. It's overwhelming. Every time I thought, let me get my thoughts together, there was something else to see or do. So there is that much to give and share with, particularly with the younger generation, but also with the older generation, with the local people. Uh, so, you know, when Shalini was talking, our downloadable stuff works to an extent, but real time walkthroughs that you can look at one object maybe, you know, it depends on whether a particular museum wants to put everything out or not uh, in and low res, but a walkthrough, a real time walkthrough at the same time as we show something else, there is a range of ways of doing it. How we will program is I think, uh, you know, something that will happen in the future. But like everyone responded in so many positive ways to the unfortunate positive word that came with the COVID, uh, but the positive reaction that we got became very creative. Yeah. And I think that's what the future of museums is probably going to be. Yeah. Whether it's real, virtual, out there, you know, that's why I use the word science fiction, downloadable into my mind. <laughs> it's a great world out there. Thank you for Thank this you. opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. I'm actually going to uh, take this a little back and come to the point of um, where did the museum culture start? And I mean, I'm not posing a question to you, it's just trying to come to the place of, like to contextualize everything you said. Uh, so, I mean, when we look at South Asia, museums were actually generally public art. So temples were community centers, you had a lot of it being like just accessible to the public. Uh, the contemporary form of museum uh, experience and museum making probably comes from Europe. Uh, and that dates back to something like 400, 450 years ago, which started as this uh, cabinet of curiosities, where I'm primarily showing you things, sh you in the sense of the audience, I'm showing you things that you don't have access to. Uh, we come back to, again, a lot of the programming things that we've talked about. Um, when I show someone an object, um, it's up to me how I spin the story of why this object is so important that I need to show it to you. So I think uh, even if we use technology, even if we use uh, people to like as actual guides who are walking us through museums, um, it might be interesting for us to now start thinking of how do we find that hook? Uh, and one of the ways that I've seen, especially in the publishing and takeaway uh, ways, and I just noted that down as well, is um, when we look at publishing or the, the museum shop, for example, uh, and again, maybe because I come from the for-profit side, it's something that I look at very keenly. There is a sense of um, achievement that one wants to have when they've spent that much time on anything, even if it's a, I mean, in an art gallery, if I walk into an art gallery like DAG, the first thing I will feel is poor <laughs> because I'm looking at something that's extraordinary. But then I can walk towards the end and even DAG has a small store. So, I can actually take back a small bit of something I like, like even if it is coasters, for example. Um, I think it's one a way to propagate an imagery and like, it's still, uh, it, it's really nice that we've used a bit of this, and, and the word can seem a little commercial, but this merchandise to propagate a visual like say, Jamini Roy. He's a national treasure. It's, uh, it's a very distinct kind of aesthetic style. And I mean, for someone that great, it will be great if the rest of the world also starts recognizing, like, you know how you can just be like, oh, that's an Andy Warhol. Inshallah, one day we'll be like, that's Jamini Roy. So um, I think that's also something that publishing and in some form merchandising in that way can do. Because again, a museum is physical. Even if we have an app, a lot of this, um, I'm talking from primary plane experience. Most people outside the art world do not know what the word walkthrough means. And they're like, Hamad, why do I need someone to walk me through this? So it's basic um, 
ways of how do you actually, it, it's that in advertising we use the word is how do you make someone come to the gate. Then I can show them that there's a really good, huh? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So if I can very quickly come in on that, you know, some of the traditional ways of storytelling, like a patachitra yes. or a fad, we have in the uh, exhibition there, we have one of the wooden, uh, it's like, a, a, like an icon thing which I've covered from Rajasthan, which opens up a portable shrine that tells a story. So you use the term of, you know, how we were using certain public spaces. Now, there again, it's full of art, but you need someone to point it out to you in today's world, in today's world. Yeah, so and I would actually say we need someone to recontextualize it because technically, till say about 60 years ago, um, we didn't restrict the concept of art as just framed objects. And I'll give you a very simple example. I'm from Lucknow. Um, in Batik pink. Validity is an artwork that is there. There's a town called Chinhat very close to Lucknow. Right. Everyone has pottery from Chinhat. And we all have a horse that resembles a Hussein horse. That can mean any medium. Right. So I think one of the other things is so many museums, including ours, are doing workshops. And because, again, you know, the city of Jaipur had this longer tradition of a lot of artisans and crafts and all that work. So we are doing that. Yes, I know we get running out of time also. But, but that workshop that to, for people to see something being created in front of you is a way. So there's the academic workshop, of course. Yeah. And all for it. I mean, yeah. I live by talking and writing. <laughs> so, but to show the work being done is yeah. what connects us again. Yeah. And this again connects us back with history, with what was done and what can be done. Hmm. But I think that's... Yeah. Uh, so lastly, we have guests from Russia uh, to take us through over a century of working in the arts and how programming and audience access have changed over the last century, um, especially in the smartphone era. So we have a presentation that they have and uh, we have our interpreter, Dr. Girish Munjal, who will help us connect with their presentation. Uh, do you need to move? Yeah, sure. This is a video. Добрый день. Мы представляем Государственный исторический музей. Один из uh, крупнейших uh, музеев России. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we represent the historical museum from Moscow, and this is one of the largest museums in Russia. Если говорить в плане нашей сегодняшней uh, темы uh, использования цифровых технологий, то в нашем музее она более чем актуальна. Uh, if you talk about the today's theme, which we are talking about, is the uh, digital technology used in museums. It, uh, our museum uses this technology a lot. Потому что музей хранит 5 миллионов коллекций. Это одна из самых больших, это самая большая коллекция в стране и не только в стране. The collection of uh, exhibits in this museum is the largest in Russia. И 5 миллионов это кто? Five millions. Это то количество, которое невозможно показать, естественно, в каком-то определенном пространстве. It's very difficult to exhibit so many uh, exhibits in one place. Uh, 
Поэтому здесь для того, чтобы максимально познакомить людей с этой коллекцией, конечно, необходимо использование самых разных способов IT-технологий. Uh, in order to show these exhibits to all, uh, all of these exhibits, we use various methods of exhibiting them and various platforms of doing it. Коллекция очень разнообразна. Она хранит практически все виды музейных материалов: ткани, бумага, археология, нумизматика и так далее, и так далее. Uh, the exhibits are very varied. Uh, they are of all, basically all museum. Um, sections which you can say I mean, it could be textiles, it could be various other items which uh, the museum exhibits. Поэтому, кроме uh, уже достаточно традиционных способов, о которых сейчас шла речь, аудиогиды, использование uh, личных uh, смартфонов для того, чтобы узнать больше технологий, используются и другие. We use various kinds of methods which we have been talking about today, uh, various platforms, portals or smartphones uh, or the audio guides. Uh, we use all kinds of these uh, methods. В частности, мы поставили перед собой целью оцифровать и презентовать всю коллекцию. Мы создаем так называемую коллекцию онлайн. Uh, we, we have created all the exhibits online where uh, the complete collection has been uh, shown. Это изображение предметов нескольких вариантов плюс информация о нем. So every exhibit is given in various dimensions in various ways uh, plus the information about every exhibit. И любой человек из любой точки мира может войти на сайт музея и познакомиться воочию практически с каждым предметом. And uh, the online site is open to The manuscripts, the ancient manuscripts, uh, to give an example, uh, they are have been shown and given information on this site. Они оцифровываются с каждую страницу полнотекстовые. The whole document is available page by page. И поэтому, опять же, любой человек может войти на сайт и изучать, и читать, и исследовать эти манускрипты по полностью. И для нас это важно, потому что других способов показать вот всю вот масштабную коллекцию на сегодняшний день практически нет. Это вот эту возможность дает эти технологии. Ну, а вот последний сюжет, который вы здесь видите, это работа реставрационных мастерских, в которых тоже uh, масса uh, новых технологий используется. Вы можете видеть на этих в видео, которые используются в музее. Такой, а такая огромная коллекция, естественно, должна реставрироваться. У нас очень большой э, со со состав, э, штат, э, отдела реставрации. We have a spe special conservation section uh, with many uh, employees in that. И там, конечно, тоже здесь очень важны использование самых разных технологий, использование лазера и так далее, и так далее. Section uses many ways of technology in conserving items. Но если вернуться к проблеме привлечения в музей, к проблеме пропагандирования коллекций, if we talk about uh, attracting audience uh, to the museum and то здесь, конечно, в основном нет равных IT-технологиям. Люди заранее очень часто заходят на сайт музея, смотрят, а потом приходят в музей. И это важно, потому что, конечно, видеть нужно подлинные экспонаты. Most of the time, our visitors they already go to the site and uh, read it first, and then visit uh, the museum. So this is uh, the dominant kind of uh, way of people uh, approaching the museum already. Спасибо, спасибо большое. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Oh. If you have any questions, you can. Uh, so, okay, I think we're already running out of time, so I'm just quickly going to wrap it up. Uh, it's nice that we ended on a QR code because I think that's also a very easy access point into a lot of things. Uh, a lot of museums at galleries now also how do you download the app or the audio guide uh, so qr code is a very easy access point and one other thing i wanted to add i mean uh, books are really great for publishing but one of the other mediums that's uh, picking up a little bit more or sort of again reviving is games and uh, i think it's it's also like how do you make it interactive and then once your brain has worked a little longer and there's a lot more registry in that sense. So I again would like to thank all the panelists uh, for coming on board and sharing really, really interesting insights with, I think we have a very vast variety of uh, experiences on, on this panel. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Priyanshi, thank you. for conducting, moderating this session so vividly, so lively. And we are thankful to all the panelists who have graced the occasion and shared their views and experiences in this panel, Ms. Tisha, Trisha De Niyogi, CEO, uh, Chief Operating Officer and uh, Director Niyogi Books, Dr. Reema Hoja, archaeologist, historian and writer, 